Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. I'm delighted to have Randolph Ness here. Um, he is the founding director of the Center for Evolution and Medicine at Arizona State University. I know him as the co-author of Why We Get Sick with George C. Williams, one of my favorite, uh, the favorite uh, evolutionary biologist, maybe after after Darwin and maybe one other person. Um, he's also the author of the new book, Good Reasons for Bad Emotions. So I'm just, uh, you know, very delighted to be talking to, talking to you, uh, Randy. We'll have a good conversation. Thanks for the invite. Excellent. So let me start with this because I'm a big fan of George C. Williams. Um, how did you decide to work with him and why did you start looking at evolution and medicine in the first place? So it started as an undergraduate. I had a professor who inspired us to do something grand and I just figured out, oh, let's try to figure out why aging exists. That's a good project for an undergraduate. It's much more relevant to me now, let me tell you. <laughs> but, um, but you know, here's the question, I mean, how fast we age depends on what genes we have. So why doesn't natural selection get rid of the genes that make us age faster? And I thought I was a very clever young fellow when I came up with the idea that it would be good for the species if some individuals died every year so the species could evolve faster. And my professor said, yep, wonderful, good idea. So that, that was my introduction to it. And of course, that was the days when you took a bus to Minneapolis from my college to write down things on index cards. And the world is so much more wonderful now for such, for such pursuits. Then I did, went to medical school at Michigan and did my psychiatry residency. And all of my friends were going down one narrow road or another. Some become psychoanalysts and some became neuroscientists and some became pharmacologists and some became behavior therapists. And I, I wanted to put it all together somehow. Um, and you know, I was just frustrated at you know, being constrained. And so I wandered over to the Museum of Natural History where some biologists were having regular discussions about behavior and said, oh, that sounds like what I'm doing. Um, and I introduced myself and they were amazingly welcoming to someone who knew very little. Um, and they said, so you've, you've studied evolutionary biology and behavior, right? I said, well, no. And they were aghast. They, they essentially said, well, how, what do you mean? How can you be a psychiatrist if you don't study evolution and animal behavior? I said, well, none of us do, you know? And, uh, so that was good. And then, uh, after a few weeks of seminars with them, I got up my nerve and explained to them my explanation for why aging exists that's good for the species. And there was this deathly silence until one person just started laughing outrageously. And as soon as that, she's since to become a good friend, Bobby Lowe, and mm -hmm. essentially, hey, you don't even know about George Williams, 1957? You don't <laughs> even know that group selection doesn't work? And all of a sudden I realized my very fancy medical education at high universities had left out half of biology. Um, that led me to trying to find something because I, I subsequently published several papers again on evolution and aging after reading George Williams's paper. Maybe everybody in the group doesn't know, but why is there aging? Um, part of it is because you know things kill off every member of a species at some point anyhow, but also if you have a gene uh, that does good things for you in childhood, when the selection is a lot stronger, that gene is gonna get selected for even if it kills you later. The okay. classic example of being one that makes your bones heal faster in childhood and also puts calcium in your coronary arteries. So that's a quick introduction to how I got connected with George Williams. Wow, wow. Now, um, when I read uh, Why We Get Sick, I mean, I was really floored by it. The idea that medicine has developed independent, largely independent, of evolution, really? I mean, I, I, I was surprised. I said, is this real? Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, as with, with my base in biology, I knew that re you really can't understand anything in biology unless you understand evolution. So how is it that medicine kind of did without biology for so long? And then what did it do in, what does your book, the first book, Why We Get Sick do for medicine? So thanks for asking that question because you know my whole career has been really based on one 
question. And that's, it's a new question. You know, I was taught in medical school to ask, why does this person get sick and other people don't get sick? How does the body work? What goes wrong? How can we fix it? It was very much of a mechanics view of, of, of the body. But once I started talking with animal behavior experts and especially with George Williams, I realized there's a whole other kind of question that needs to be answered, which is why did natural selection make it that way? And I can say that when George Williams and I first had conversations, uh, we made a bad mistake. Uh, we constantly asked each other, what good is breast cancer? What good is coronary artery disease? What good is you know, autoimmune disease? And it took us a month or so to be realized that th those are stupid questions because those are not things shaped by natural selection. What natural selection shapes are traits that make us vulnerable. Uh -huh. And that's the key to everything. And my whole career since has been asking the question, why did natural selection leave us so vulnerable to disease in general and to mental disorders in particular? You think it would have done a better job, you know? Wow. 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 So the same thing, Let, let's take some examples just from health outside of mental health Good. of how it makes it uh, vulnerable. And then we will go, go to mental health because health people can understand it better. So can you give some examples? In everybody, why on earth do we have wisdom teeth? I mean, thank you, no. Or the appendix. And, and for women, that narrow birth canal, um, why not just have something in, to have the baby come out of the front of the abdomen? Um, and why, are, why do we have all this inflammation that causes cardiac disease and Alzheimer's disease and, and all of the rest? And there's so many areas where natural selection could have done a better job. Um, or you take the, the nerve that makes our vocal cords work, you know, it starts here and it goes all the way down around an artery you had a heart and then comes back up again behind in your esophagus. Whoa, that makes for all kinds of opportunities mm -hmm. for, for problems. And then there's hernias and you, know, it's, you name it. Oh, it's, it almost seems like every part of the body that could go wrong does go wrong. But then you study anatomy and physiology and it's absolutely astounding how wonderful things are. I mean, the recurrent system in the kidneys that balances your salt and water, I mean, it's fabulous. Your heart keeps pumping for 80 or 100 years without taking a break. No, no regular pump can do that, you know? Um, and our minds, I mean, my gosh, we can remember things from decades ago and we can keep track of 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 friends and enemies. Um, so this contrast is really strong between so many things in the body being so exquisitely wonderful and so many things in the body seem jury rigged at best. I mean, what's going on here? How do we, how do we think about this? Well, well now, so you guys started kind of really started this field with that book about 25 years ago. How, what Actually, direction? Go ahead. It was, it was exactly 30 years ago that we wrote an article grandly titled The Dawn of Darwinian Medicine. Mm -hmm. George insisted on the grand title and he was the senior guy, so he got to say. And I thought it was too grand, but he turned out to be right because it's now grown into a really wide field with many, many books and programs and, and degrees and, and all the rest. The book was what caught on though. And you no, know, that was a risky thing to do. We wrote it so that it would be interesting to everybody instead of being a fancy academic book that costs $50. Um, and at first it didn't get taken seriously um, by academics. But gradually, it became taught, being taught in courses, and, and it still remains taught in many courses now, even though it's out of date. Um, I'm so glad you enjoyed it. You said you gave copies to lots of people. Yeah, yeah. I, I, just, I just bought, I don't know how many it was, like 18 or 20 copies, and I just gave it to everybody that I knew. Because I owe you at least a cup of coffee then for all the while. <laughs> yes, yes. I will, I will collect on it when you visit New York next. Yes. Um, so... Um, let's talk about psychiatry. So what was psychiatry like? And what did you see as problems in psychiatry that you, you go ahead? Well, well, the first thing is to, I mean, sometimes people think that, you no, know, this is kind of anti-psychiatry or something like that. No, absolutely not. I think it's just about the most wonderful profession. My friend said, why are you going into psychiatry? Uh, so many people can't be helped. Exactly the opposite. Almost everybody can be helped. It's it's very satisfying work. It's stressful work because every single patient demands full attention and you know, really trying to understand people one by one. 
Um, but it's also frustrating because you know, so many schools of psychiatry want to find all answers in one principle. You know, it's all learning theory, or it's all psychodynamics, or it's all brain abnormalities, or it's all early family experiences, or it's all marital problems. You know, it, there's a strong tendency for people to emphasize one thing or another. Um, and furthermore, the, the field, when I began, it was just when the DSM was being revised. Uh -huh. I, mean, I, I was a part of that process. And people said, we don't know where this is going to go, but finally we can be objective about diagnosis. And it did transform everything once we started having checklists for diagnosis. And everybody thought then, this was 1970, uh, 1974, that we would soon find specific brain abnormalities for these problems. And it would be like Alzheimer's disease or multiple sclerosis or something. So here we are, you know, 40 years later, we haven't found any specific brain abnormalities for any of them. And there are brain differences but you can't diagnose any major psychiatric disorder using scans or genes or hormones or anything. Um, I mean, so many of my friends have spent their entire lives doing that. I spent my early career doing neuroendocrine responses to anxiety and, and the like. But I think the key here is that we have not been using the science that's the basis for understanding behavior and all the rest of science, which is evolution. Wow. And asking a question about, why do animals and humans do the things that they do? And the simple basic principle is that individuals who do things that transmit more of their genes to the next generation, transmit more of their genes to the next generation. And this is such a profound foundation uh, for, uh, it's a null hypothesis for, for everything. You, you mentioned that it was traumatic for you when you thought about it. That it, it was, basically... yeah, it still is for many people, I think, and I bet it was for you too. Mm -hmm. um, and George Williams's book, for those who don't know, in 1966, uh, pointed out that natural selection does not work for the benefit of a species or a group. It works for the benefit of genes. I mean, for me, my, my example is that Walt Disney movie. Uh, does anybody remember the movie from the 50s where those lemmings jump into the fjord because it's good for the species? Because if they all tried to keep eating, they'd eat up all the food and then they'd all starve. Um, but even to that example, when George and I were talking, he said, well, Randy, think about it. Um, not all of them jump into the fjord, even though it would be good for the species. Some of them stay back and make babies which ones pass on more of their genes? And I thought, oh my God, I've been thinking wrong about you know, behavior and evolution my entire career. I better get this straight. And I should emphasize that it's still amazingly controversial. I mean, the simple principle is that a gene that becomes, I mean, people argue about what's called the altruism problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, if an individual is more altruistic than others and has fewer offspring than others, then their genes are gonna become less frequent. So that seems to make altruism impossible. Uh -huh. And George Williams was tortured by this his whole career. I'm not sure if you've read some of his later things about it, but he says in one book, um, if there is any such thing as altruism in humans, it can only be one of those accidents that happens sometimes. Uh -huh. So I really devoted myself for a couple of decades to trying to figure out how can we understand genuine committed relationships among people and the origins for our moral passions, which seemed very real to me, especially in the clinic. I didn't, I didn't see patients who were, you know, trying to think up sly ways of having sex with somebody illicitly. I, may, I mainly had, you know, patients who were wondering if they accidentally insulted somebody by not smiling at them on the street, you know? Um, so we'll, we'll come in a minute. Let, let's go on and we can come back to my solution to that and the continuing debate about it, if you like. Please. Uh, so let, let's now look at kind of evolution and mental health. So you, in your book, you talk about six evolutionary reasons why we are vulnerable to disease. Can you yeah. tell us about that? Well, the first principle is where was the field when we got started? I mean, I was taught, and I asked in medical school, hey, how come so many of us are nearsighted? You know, this would not be good for us. Uh -huh. um, and my professor said, well, you have to get used to it. Mutations happen. Um, and that is indeed true. Uh, natural selection can't get rid of all mutations. Um, but is that the only reason why we're not you know, healthier, why we're vulnerable? Another really big one is living in modern environments that we were never prepared for. 
-hmm. And I'm sure almost everybody in this meetup um, struggles like I do with eating too much because we all do because the food is so good and plentiful and, and, and all the rest. And then of course there are temptations with drugs that get us into addictive cycles. Um, and, then, uh, and then there are bureaucracies that we're supposed to cope with and live in. Um, we were never evolved to cope with bureaucracies and dead end jobs and things like that. I mean, there's so many things or birth control. Whoa, I mean, we could go there if we want to. Um, I mean, so many things, we're, we're, our minds are just ill, ill prepared for them. Um, in fact, most of the genes that the New York Times reports on with breathless excitement every week or two for a new gene for heart disease, new gene for you know, anorexia nervosa. Um, well, if you realize that there wasn't any heart disease for our ancestors, you realize that those genes are not genes for heart disease. They're genes for any number of other things and they didn't hurt anybody way back when. It's only when they interact with modern environments. Likewise for nearsightedness. I mean, it's a genetic disease. Whether you're nearsighted or not depends almost entirely on what genes you have. But hunter-gatherers are not nearsighted. Mm -hmm. um, there's something about our early lives uh, that influences whether we get, I mean, if you have the genes, you're going to get nearsighted. Mm -hmm. um, so th that's only the first two. For number one, hey, there's things natural selection can't mm -hmm. do. Number mm -hmm. two, natural selection is slow. Mm -hmm. So you know, it takes, you know, 100,000 years to make major changes of, of many sorts. So um, I often joke with people, they say, well, what's, what's, what's evolving now? Well, what's the biggest thing that kills young people when evolution is the strongest? And the answer is auto accidents. And what's the biggest thing that causes auto accidents? Drinking and driving. Mm -hmm. So what's gonna happen? Well, I don't think we know, but either natural selection will make people not like alcohol, or it will make us able to drive a whole lot better while we're drunk. Mm -hmm. One of the two. Interesting. There are other reasons though, there, everything is a trade-off. Nothing can be perfect because every one thing, you can put your blood pressure lower so you don't have any many problems, but if your blood pressure is lower, you can't run as fast or respond as, as quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the biggest one of all, I think that I still find so disturbing. And that is the whole damn system was never shaped for our benefit. It was shaped for our genes benefit. Mm -hmm. and especially, I mean, this is such a foundation for doing psychotherapy and, and understanding our own lives. I and mean, if you look at it, half the things we're desperate to do have to do with sex and reproduction. Mm -hmm. um, and they're just, you know, it's gonna screw up our lives. Um, but that's the way we and all animals are, are designed uh, is to, I'll stop at that point. We can come yeah, back. No, that's, that's good. What, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to come back to this issue of kind of moral passions mm -hmm. and this, you know, our, our benefit um, towards the, uh, you know, in, in a little while, because I want to hit the points about evolution uh, first, and then we'll come back to this. Good. So the next question is, you know, the, the book is called Good Reasons for Bad Emotions. So tell me what what is the normal and useful function of bad emotions? Right. First, I should tell you that the publisher, it's Random House, basically, uh, they insisted on having a title that would appeal to people in airports, you know? Um, <laughs> and, you know, so good reasons for bad feelings was, was the title. I wanted to call it, you know, why minds go awry, because it's not just about emotions. Mm -hmm. It's also about eating disorders and addiction and schizophrenia and autism and, and all these other problems. But that, that seemed too academic or, or something. So mm -hmm. there are, are such, there's such a wide variety of, of things that we, we could talk about. But I, I, now I've missed your question for yeah, a moment. So the question is why, what is the function? What is what, the normal and well, useful function of bad emotions? Right. And you know, I have been practicing psychiatry for 10 years, helping to start one of the world's first anxiety disorders clinics, research clinics at the University of Michigan. And I realized that I was treating emotions every day, all day, and I didn't know what they were for or why they existed. So I decided to open my thousand page psychiatry textbook. And there I found one half of one page about emotions. I thought, well, that's interesting. Um, and then I went from there and you know, did some reading and I got completely discouraged 
because it seemed like everybody was arguing about how many basic emotions are there and are they dimensions or basic emotions and, and what's the function of each one? It was just frustrating. And then as you may remember from the book, I read William James uh -huh. and William James also read about emotions for a long time. And he concluded, I'd rather move rocks around on a New Hampshire farm than read that stuff again. There's no point to it, no center, no logic to it. Uh -huh. So then I took a very, I took six months and a year really and just read everything I could about emotions. And I came to a very simple conclusion that's caught on quite nicely with emotions research. And that is that we shouldn't ask what the function is for each emotion. Instead, we should ask in what situation was it useful? Because it's the situations that have shaped each emotion. And to the extent there are separate emotions, they correspond not to different functions, but to different situations. So the, the classic situation of you feel a lion's hot breath on your back, um, that's a dangerous situation. Um, and the, that's what a panic attack is for, you know, um, is that particular situation. Um, on the other hand, if, if your lover starts whispering into your ear, having a panic attack then is not good at all uh, for your reproduction. Uh, it's so important. I mean, these emotions are not useful or useless unless, except in the right situation. And we immediately come to the fact that most people imagine, and I bet people will want to discuss this in, in the discussion section. I mean, it seems like bad feelings are abnormal and bad. Uh -huh. I mean, everybody kind of gets that anxiety can be useful to get you out of a dangerous situation. But what about feeling low and depressed? What about feeling jealous? What about feeling bored? What about feeling, you know, I mean, are those things useful? And the answer is yes. The capacities for anxiety, depression, jealousy, and all the rest are useful. But then the next question is, so are they useful most of the time? They sure don't seem like it. And we can move on from there if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, let me take uh, I, I want to go along a couple of paths. So one is we have, uh, we've spent a lot of time looking at Yak Panksepp's uh, yeah. conception work on emotions. So do you have any, any comments, any thoughts about that? I do. Yak actually was also at University of Michigan. Oh. Uh, I was there. So we had good long conversations. Um, and he was such a fine scholar. You know, his long book is just packed with knowledge about both neuroscience and evolution. And that's what I gave him a hard time about, actually, because, you know, there are these two different kinds of questions that need to be answered about everything in biology. One is, how does it work? And the other is, what's it for? And how did it get that way? And, and it seems to me, Yak was always kind of going back and forth with all of that at the same time. And it made it very hard for him to really target in on the question of, you know, why do we have this capacity for, for mood at all? because he kept going back to the amygdala um, and, and the frontal lobe and its connections. And I think this is a common, I would call it a problem with neuroscientists. They want to map certain functions to certain spots. Um, and I've recently written an article about that actually, and I call it tacit creationism. Hmm. And by tacit creationism, I mean thinking about the body and the mind as if they're machines, even though you don't believe some deity created them, but thinking about them as if they're machines because machines have specific parts, the specific functions and specific connections between them. But our bodies aren't like that and our minds aren't like that. And all these attempts to locate where in the mind does depression happen? Where in mind does anxiety happen? I mean, it's the amygdala. The amygdala mm -hmm. does all kinds mm -hmm. of things, thank you. Um, and anxiety is mediated by all kinds of other areas too. I think we fundamentally been thinking incorrectly about these systems as if they're machines. And sadly, they're not just way more complicated, they have a whole different kind of organic complexity. This takes us down another route. We should probably come back. Yes. So let's, um, one of the things I find very intriguing is your concept of smoke detector idea. Can right. you talk a little bit about that? But that comes directly from being frustrated in the clinic. I mean, here I was treating patients with bad anxiety all day long. Once I realized uh, that anxiety was useful, uh -huh. I started wondering, oh my gosh, am I interfering with some normal useful response? Uh -huh. It certainly didn't seem like it. You know, my patients uh -huh. had losing jobs and, and you know, all kinds of terrible things happening to them because of their anxiety. But still I had to ask myself, 
um, why were there so many episodes of anxiety that seemed useless? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I literally thought about that for six months. And finally, I started learning more about what's called signal detection theory, which is mm -hmm. what electronics engineers use to, to calculate whether a click coming across a line is an intended signal or just static. Mm -hmm. And I applied that to the situation of anxiety. And the, the you know, analogy I use is back to the lions in Africa. Again, you're, you're at a watering hole at night and you're trying to get water for your family and you hear a noise behind a rock. And the noise is something like, Ur. if it was, Ur, you just run because uh -huh. you'd die if you didn't. Um, and if it was, you know, Ur, um, uh -huh. then you wouldn't run because it's probably not a lion. Uh -huh. um, so the question I asked myself is how loud does the noise have to be uh -huh. before it's optimal to run away as fast as you can? Uh -huh. And that depends on how much it costs to run away, call it 100 uh -huh. calories, uh -huh. and how much it costs if you don't run away and there's a lion there, uh -huh. call it 100,000 calories. Uh -huh. What's the ratio? 100 to 100,000, that's a 1,000 to 1 ratio. Uh -huh. And without going into the math, that means that any time the noise is loud enough to indicate a greater than one and 1,000 chance of a lion being there, you should run as fast as you can and have a panic attack. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't believe my math, actually, Shrikant. Mm -hmm. uh, that can't be right. That means that the panic attacks I'm seeing, that 999 out of 1,000 are perfectly normal but useless. Wow. But that turns out to be correct. And it's not just for anxiety. I mean, what, what doctors do mostly is not cure diseases. What mm -hmm. doctors do is relieve suffering, mm -hmm. relieve pain, fever, nausea, vomiting, you know, all kinds of things. And we do it by using drugs that block normal responses. And people don't just die right and left because we do it. And the reason is the smoke detector principle. Mm -hmm. All of these systems are shaped to go off lots of times when they're not needed. Wow. Um, you talk about focusing on symptoms, you know, being obsessed with symptoms rather than causes. Yeah. Um, perhaps the biggest message my work has for my field of psychiatry um, mm -hmm. is that we've been confusing symptoms with diseases. Mm -hmm. And I really think evolution can make psychiatry much more like the rest of medicine. In medicine, if you, if you go in with abdominal pain, the doctor doesn't say you have abdominal pain disorder. The doctor says you're having pain and there's mm -hmm. probably a reason for it. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a big search to try to find out what causes it. If nothing can be found, then it might be concluded that you have you know, a pain disorder where the pain system is not, not normal, but usually there's something causing it. Likewise, if you have cough or fever, um, those are symptoms. They're useful symptoms, but they're symptoms, not diseases. When we come to emotions uh, of, about anxiety and depression and anger and all the rest, um, they just seem so obviously abnormal usually that is so tempting to assume that there's something wrong in the brain. And I'll emphasize right here, a lot of people do have something wrong in the brain. I don't wanna make any generalization about, you know, they're all normal use. No, I think a lot of people have, for one reason or another, brains that are wired somewhat differently or, or have been damaged. Um, but nonetheless, this is a crucial way of trying to make psychiatry more like the rest of medicine. Let's take uh, emotion, which is particularly hard, grief so how do you think about grief once you understand evolution how do you think about grief uh, it is so hard Shri Kent. um when i first moved to the institute for social research at the university of michigan the director asked me um you want to understand why depression exists what's the study you'd really like to do no holds barred i said no what i'd really like to have is a large study of bereavement and i'd like to find out what's wrong with those people um, who don't have grief because the fact that the rest of us suffer so much from grief mean, must mean that it's useful somehow. And he got this sly smile on his face. And he said, well, what if I told you that the world's largest prospective study of grief ever had been done and all the people who ran it have left for elsewhere and the data is already cleaned and in the computer ready for analysis. <laughs> and I said, oh shit, I, <laughs> I guess that's gonna be my life, isn't it? So uh -huh. I spent a number of years uh, trying to get that data ready for everyone, and we published a book and lots of papers based on understanding grief better. But it didn't really answer my questions, Shrikant, because you know, I thought we were going to find, well, first of all, our big conclusion is there's no one such thing as normal grief, right? Mm -hmm. People are different. 
A third of people don't experience much grief. A third of people have chronic grief. The best predictor of who experiences the most grief um, is who experienced a lot of depression before. And the thing I was taught in psychiatry repeatedly is if someone has chronic grief, it means they have had an ambivalent relationship with the person who was lost and therefore you need to get in touch with that ambivalence in order to help them get over their grief. Hmm. So we looked at that question with our detailed data. We didn't find that. People who had ambivalent relationships with the, with the lost one often did quite a lot better, thank you, after the oh. person passed away. Oh. Uh, the people who were most aggrieved were, were those who were closest um, to the person and who didn't have other people to, to, to rely on. But I say this did not answer my question about depression because looking very carefully at the data, what I learned once again is that people are subjective. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, some people who said at six months, we studied people at six mm -hmm. months, and 12 months, 18 months, and four years after they lost a loved one. Um, many of them who said at six months, no, I never experienced any bereavement. No, I, it didn't bother me. Um, ask them a year later, they said, well, actually, for six months, I couldn't even work. What? That's <laughs> not what you said uh, back then. Mm -hmm. Um, and it really made me you know, recognize how profoundly subjective we all are. Uh, there's a bit, we still do not know the answer about whether grief is use, useful in any way at all, or if it's just what we call an epiphenomenon, an accident. However, we could come back to this deeper or common question about depression. Mm -hmm. Why the heck are we all so vulnerable to depression? Yes, please. Can we just go on? I bet everybody in this group has thought about that one way or another. And how we think about it, I think, influences our lives quite a lot. I mean, sometimes people blame themselves. I should be stronger, you know? Uh, sometimes people blame their parents. Sometimes people blame their brains. Increasingly, people blame their brains because they're told that often by their therapists. Some people feel like they need to get better, more in touch with you know, their unconscious lives. And all of those things, I think, can be true. So I don't think... We need to pick a winner here. But my question is different. It's not why some people get depressed. It's why the very capacity for mood itself exists at all. Mm -hmm. And there are dozens of papers out there saying the function of low mood is this or that. Notice I'm using the phrase low mood, mm -hmm. not depression. Because mm -hmm. these days, as soon as you hear it say depression, uh, people assume you're talking about bad clinical serious disease kind of depression. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna use the phrase low mood to be kind of like mild ordinary depression. Um, but so then I asked myself this question about, is there some circumstance in which being pessimistic and lack of energy and it's kind of anxious and feeling bad about yourself might be useful? Mm -hmm. um, and the, it turns out the answer to that is already out there. There's no new ideas here. Um, there's a fellow in Minnesota um, who wrote detailed in detailed ways about this uh, back in the 60s. Um, his name is going to come to me in just a minute. But the key to it is that you know, it's useful to adjust our initiative and our amount of energy mm -hmm. depending on the situations that we're in. Mm -hmm. In a propitious situation where you get big payoffs um, for small amounts of effort, hey, get out there and do stuff. Mm -hmm. But life is not always like that. Uh, sometimes, you know, going out in the cold in the winter looking for root vegetables when you can't break through the ice is just a waste of time. And you're better off staying in your cave. And applying for a job when there's no jobs to be had, we got to keep doing it, but it's an awful hard business. Huh. And trying to, you know, ask for a raise when the boss has turned you down twice before, um, you could. But there are all kinds of situations we get into where trying harder just makes things worse. Interesting. I want to come back to your first, the point that you made earlier about moral passions, because it's really fascinating. So please, please tell us about that. So I've been talking about mood as mostly having to do with like going out and getting vegetables, you know, um, but of course it's not that with the, the valued thing for humans is mostly other relationships. Mm -hmm. and being members of groups and, and getting status in groups too. So mostly what we think about when we lie in bed at night, you know, is not root vegetables. It's, you know, whether somebody smiled at us or whether people like us or not and all the rest. The debate about how we came to be moral beings is so convoluted. I won't try to get into all the details. Some people still talk as if, you know, it's benefits to groups. Uh, and groups are crucial 
but it's groups selecting us, not us selecting groups. You know, groups are, you know, we're, we're trying to do things that make us appealing to groups. I found the answer that I find satisfying, and, and I think most people do these days, um, in a work by Mary Jane West Eberhard, an insect biologist. Oh. And she talked about social selection. Oh. Social selection being the, how the selection force is created when individuals make choices about who they associate with. Um, and it, another, another way, word for it is partner choice, because a whole lot of what we do in life is, is talk to people about who's good, who's bad, who's reliable, who's generous, who's selfish, who's untrustworthy. And we're always trying to figure out who do we want to hang out with, who do we want to work with, what groups do we want to be a part of. And more than that, everybody else is doing the same thing. They're trying to figure out, do they want to hang out with us? Do they want to let us in their group? Do they want you know, all the rest? And this means that those people who are the most preferred as partners end up getting the best partners. And because they get the best partners, they just do better in life and have more children. Hmm. So this is a partner choice um, model. It leads to the selective association of people who have tendencies for altruism. And Mary Jane West Everhard wondered if maybe this led to runaway selection of the sort that makes peacock's tails so huge. Um, it might be that there's an, a contest. We're all advertising how good we are and how valuable we are for groups, meaning that it kind of takes off by itself and, mm -hmm. and overshoots. Of course, then the other problem is people fake these kind of things all the, all the time. So this makes life complicated. And, and that's why we write novels, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because there's so, such richness uh, to try to understand. Wow. Um, Randy, I want to give time for my folks to ask you questions. So what we're going to do, this is, we put kind of basic ideas down here. Uh, folks, um, I've tried to cover kind of many of the key points of the book. Uh, there is no substitute to reading the book. You need to read the book. You need to go, I, I'm going to put the link out in, in the chat as soon as we come back uh, from the breakout rooms. So I'm starting the breakout rooms now. Uh, they will last for 20 minutes. And we have rules for breakout rooms. Let me go ahead and put them in the chat. These are all designed so that everybody gets to put their two cents in before we go into any kind of discussion, detailed discussion. So the first rule is uh, start the breakout rooms by letting everyone speak for one to two minutes on what they got from the talk, uh, raise whatever questions you know, that they want to do, uh, raise. And the rules are keep on topic, be brief, be courteous, encourage others to speak, and if needed, just click on ask for help and I'll help, help you. And in 20 minutes, automatically we'll come back into this room and then you'll get to share your takeaways as well as ask questions. I'm starting the breakout rooms now. Welcome back folks, welcome back. All right, folks, so it's time for takeaways and questions. So, um, we have four rules that have worked really beautifully for us for the past five years. Rule number one, type an exclamation mark in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom in order to speak. Rule number two, keep on topic. Rule number three, be brief. And rule number four, feel free to disagree with anybody on anything. Speak your mind, but do so courteously. All right, those are the rules. Uh, you can go ahead and type an exclamation mark in order to speak. You can talk about your takeaway and you can talk about your questions. You can just do just takeaway, just question or both and try to be brief so we can get to as many people as possible. So we're going to start with Govert followed by L. Govert. Uh, yes, thank, thank you so much so far for uh, this very interesting uh, session. Um, I come up with some questions, uh, whether you were uh, also plugged into what is more of a so-called continental or European tradition in psychiatry and as the existential. Uh, R.D. Lane, Maddard Boss, Bean Swanger, uh, many of them go back to Sartre and Heidegger in their origin. And they have very profound things to say how our situatedness is connected with mood and with language. Got it. Thank you. Uh, let me go ahead and have uh, Randy respond to that. Uh, Randy, go ahead. 
Um, spot on with that. Um, the first serious book I ever read was Being and Nothingness, which was kind of ridiculous for a kid. I didn't actually get it. Um, but I had a wonderful course as a junior psychiatrist about evolutionary psychiatry. And we read all the people that you're talking about. Of course, that's not allowed these days. Um, but back then, it was very inspiring to me. And trying to understand what gives a person's life meaning um, has always been central. And whether we create that meaning or whether it's there to start with, it seems to me there is an evolutionary angle on that, actually, uh, that our lives feel meaningful to us when we're pursuing, you know, evolutionarily relevant goals and making progress towards them. Uh, if and, and we spend a lot of time trying to figure out, so what should I do? At least that's what I did when I was a kid. What should I, we all do, you know, in life. Um, and it's such a hard problem. And I think the, the answer is, doesn't matter too much what you do as long as you pick something uh, and do it. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be L, Nash, and Lester. Folks, you can line up for asking questions mm -hmm. and uh, giving your takeaways by typing exclamation mark in the chat. Uh, next up, L, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, I would like to ask. Um, I I did miss the first twenty minutes, um, but if you would like to say something about um, brain physiology and emotions, I guess, and where I might be able to find literature outside of your writings, just to corroborate some of the. Um, the statements and the construct that you have. And thank so, uh, you. you. You might well start by watching a video from the 52 Ideas one from a week or so ago, or, or just maybe just a day ago, um, by Jak Panksepp um, and his collaborator, who I don't know as well, because that they're experts on brain physiology and emotion. But one of the largest takeaway points I'd like people to leave with is that trying to understand why these systems are the way they are is an entirely different question from trying to understand how do they work. Wonderful. Uh, Thank next you. up is going to be a Nash. Nash, go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, Dr. Jesse, I know uh, maybe just if you want to expound upon where you were headed with that last comment on the fusion of evolutionary psychiatry and complex system science and feedback loops. So this, this is my passion right now and what I'm working on mostly. And that is that you know, stability and homeostasis is the essence of health and dysregulated complex systems is the essence of disease. And the question I'm asking myself is, are there certain systems that are intrinsically vulnerable to going into positive feedback loops, dead ends, or otherwise um, getting tangled up in ways on an information level. I think this is one reason why we cannot find brain abnormalities is because just like when your computer crashes, 99 times out of 100, it's the software, not the hardware. And I think that's exactly the same for the information processing in our brain. There is an example I wanted to give that you know, the, most of these emotional systems are designed so that when they keep going off, it means that they haven't been sensitive enough and they need to go off more easily. Pain, for instance, uh, if you keep smashing your finger, um, does it get numb? No, it gets more and more sensitive every time you do it because that means that the pain has not been sufficient to protect you. Same for anxiety and the same for depression. Um, it may well be that positive feedback kicks in with those things. And I mean, for depression in modern times, used to be you got depressed, you went in your hut, and then you got hungry and you came out and you hung out with relatives and you had to go get food. Nowadays, you can go shut your door and eat a bag of Doritos and turn off the computer and the telephone. And of course that leads to a nasty, nasty feedback cycle where you start believing that nobody cares about you and, and all the rest. Thank you. Next up is Lester, Anthony and Suting. Lester, go ahead. Well, today is a special treat because a couple of hours ago, we had another talk on brain evolution about Julian James's theories on consciousness. And the critical part of that is that something major happened in the human brain 4,000 years ago. But in your introduction, you said major changes in the brain are 100, I mean, 100,000 years. So What's your opinion on Julian James's theory that the brain changed 4,000 years ago? Lester, I just want to, con uh, just want to uh, clarify. Julian James doesn't say that at all. 
Uh, Julian James is not claiming anything about the change of the brains. He thinks the brain is the same. It's just, he's saying that it's being used differently. When you do different things like language, it changes what you do with it, but, but not, nothing about brain structure. So there is not, nothing on, it's, uh, whatever Julian James is saying is not an evolutionary point. But, but uh, it is his stuff about the bicameral brain, correct? Uh, yes. Yeah, and, and he emphasizes overwhelmingly the importance of language and how it might make us vulnerable to schizophrenia and other kinds of things. Yes. And I've tried hard to understand his point and I've never succeeded um, exactly in, in, in doing that. I have argued, however, in the book, in the chapter about schizophrenia and autism, that natural selection has very likely been shaping us very strongly uh, in the past, you know, just, well, it continues to act from 100,000 years to 10,000 years to, to more recently. Um, cognitive things are so important to our success that it's very likely that rapid changes leave us vulnerable. Uh, and also we have such extraordinary cognitive powers that our minds are like fancy race cars that can go very, very fast, but are very, very light and very, very fragile. Um, they're, they're made to be pushed to performance limits uh, at the price of stability and robustness. Oh, that's, that's fascinating. Thank you. Uh, next up is Anthony, Suiting, Madeline, and Mike. Anthony. Anthony, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry, mate. There we go. Um, so, look, there's a quick one. Randy, once I heard you say, uh, actually in a video, you said um, uh, uh, evolution doesn't shape disease. It shapes our susceptibility to it, if I'm correct, or something akin right. to that. And um, I'm trying to wrap that in my head, but it's still not 100% clear. But you said if somebody starts saying that, stop that. And I was wondering... One, one, can you explain it? But also, two, what's the consequence if people make that confusion? I appreciate this question so much because you know, my, my critique of psychiatry is we often view symptoms as if they are diseases. And sometimes they're diseases, but usually they are not. But the risk in, in evolutionary psychiatry is that people view diseases as if they are adaptations. And you can find all kinds of articles where people claim that the value of schizophrenia or the adaptive significance of eating disorders or how addiction is good for you. Um, and I think those are just cognitive mistakes that people make. I mean, if you're going to have an evolutionary explanation, it should be for some trait that everybody shares not traits that only a few people have. Because if, you know, some, I mean, for bi bipolar disease is of special interest, actually. Um, if bipolar disease really resulted reliably in having more children, we'd all have it, right? But now pause, maybe we do all have it to a small degree. I mean, if you actually study bipolar disease, there's an absolute continuum from people who have the really bad bipolar type one extremes of mood and a whole lot of people, maybe half the population, who have considerable mood swings uh, that they find hard to understand. So I think we need to be understanding all of these things in terms of why does the system exist in the first place, in what situation is it useful, and what are the advantages and disadvantages of being towards one end or the other end. So I really appreciate that question. The whole field of evolutionary psychiatry is growing very fast now. There are 1,500 psychiatrists in the Royal College of Psychiatry group. And the risk for the field is that people are going to start trying to find evolutionary explanations for things that didn't evolve, like diseases. The key is to say, what's the trait that makes us vulnerable to disease? The narrow birth canal, the narrow coronary arteries, the excess inflammatory response, the capacity for having low mood. Thank you. Next up is Su Ting, Madeline, Mike, and Lester. Su Ting. Hi, uh, Randolph. Um, so I also asked ask a similar question in the, the, the breakout group. So it, ha there, it has been reported, like there's been widely uh, this phenomenon and more and more number of people are getting diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and all kinds of these things. So there's this trend the number of people with negative emotion is going up. So then in terms of this uh, revolutional psychiatry, what, 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 what's your, your, your thought on this? Are we 
it's Jane trying to bring us into some specific direction or it's just a coping mechanism? So fortunately, it's not as bad as it seems from the newspapers. Uh, the newspapers report on every single thing saying a huge epidemic of this and that and all the rest. Um, if you actually look at the data where they go back to the same community 30 years later and ask rates of depression and the like, there's not much evidence that there is a big new epidemic. It may be that in young people in, in the UK who are using cell phones all the time that rates of depression are up somewhat. I think that's a pretty good study, but most of the studies um, do not actually show increases in rates of clinically significant depression or anxiety. There was a big spike in, in the midst of the crack epidemic in New York. Um, guess what? People's lives were falling apart and therefore uh, they became depressed and, and anxious. But I think the whole idea that, you know, another related idea is we're in modern times and we're all so anxious and depressed because we live in modern times. And it's salutary to read Romans, uh, the, the ancient Romans about that. And they too were constantly going on about how stressed we all are because we're in modern times. So I, I think you know, this is a distortion from news media. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Mad Madeline, Mike, and Lester. Madeline. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ness. Uh, this has been a terrific presentation. Um, it's two big areas of interest of mine, um, evolutionary biology and also how it works with systems theory. Uh, my personal Bible has been um, Jacob Bond Wexkull's Forays into the Worlds of Animals and Humans. Um, he's sort of in the Kantian continental philosophers tradition. He, he gave a talk at the American Psychiatric Association meeting in 1974 in Detroit that greatly inspired me. Would, could you tell us a bit about that? Um, because biosemiotics is my big interest. So it was many years ago and I have not read him carefully. So I can't, I can't help you in, in the specifics of all of that. Um, but, but you know, just simply, you know, I guess all I can really say is trying to think about these things in the large scale instead of just a reductionistic uh, small scale and trying to think about their human meaning instead of just mechanisms, um, there's a huge opportunity there. But no one will pay you to do it. I mean, you can't get a grant to do it, you know, and it's not going to lead to a new drug. And it probably doesn't even need to lead to a new patentable kind of therapy. So it's just for those of us who are interested, and I think it is profoundly helpful to understand these things. And I, I've gotten many notes from people who say, I read the book and now I kind of get what these mental disorders really are instead of you know, a simplistic version. I appreciated the comments from several people before about how we humans are simple thinkers. We all are. Um, and that's the way it goes. Yeah, I, I liked what you said about tacit creationism uh, kind of relates to being a simple thinker. You can find that on my website if you're interested. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madeline. Next up is going to be Mike, Jyoti, and Lester. Mike, I'll give you two minutes. Okay. Uh, without uh, knowing as much as I do now about you, we discussed, I discussed you with Brian McVeigh who's a, a Julian person at that session a few hours ago. And uh, I, I think we came to the conclusion, or I came to the conclusion, maybe it was erroneously, that the hardware is basically the same as it was uh, maybe even a million years ago, but it's the software that's changed. And a baby is born with uh, essentially a blank slate, only neurons and very few interconnections. And so uh, that all gets put together very quickly and maybe in the first six months. Now, uh, and from that viewpoint, uh, uh, is, uh, Dawkins talks about a meme. So is, uh, is most of this uh, evolution cultural because the baby is basically a hunter-gatherer in principle who, because how he's raised, he gets to be a uh, nuclear scientist after a period of time. 
Uh, is so your, your, your comment speaks to a debate that's gone on for decades and will continue to go on for decades. And that is, are we basically hardwired in certain rigid ways? Or are we basically vastly flexible? So culture really explains everything. And I don't find those debates very helpful because the answer I mean, is, I mean, if you want to have a good meme, pick one extreme and argue for it. Um, but if you want to actually understand things, you know, there are some things that are kind of built in and a whole lot of things that are what we call prepared learning. Um, monkeys are prepared to learn a fear of snakes, but they don't have an innate fear of snakes. Um, and then there are always vague tendencies that we have. I mean, why do we want to like, why, why do we try to make people smile? Um, and what do we recognize about a smile? What exactly shape of the lips is it that makes us, our, our dopamine go off? And I think if you think about how natural selection actually works, it is that brains vary because partly of what genes they have. And those brains that um, end up making individuals do things that make them succeed better and have more offspring, those are the brains we have. But even as I say that, our brains aren't alike. I mean, there's no such thing as a normal brain. Uh, there's vast, vast differences because we have different genes and different experiences with our environment. One of my huge themes is that people are different and you can't make global generalizations. Next up is Jyoti followed by Lester. Jyoti, go ahead. Yeah, in our breakout room, we were a little confused about what you had said about the grief, the process of grief. We didn't quite understand. Did you say we don't grieve? Human beings don't grieve? Or uh, ambivalence theory about if you are ambivalent about the person who died or that you had uh, refuted that theory. So can you explain a little bit about that? Thanks for a chance to clarify that. Um, I, I certainly didn't say we don't grieve. Most people do grieve and it's a terrible kind of suffering. The question is whether it's useful or whether it's more of an accident. And the, the answer to that is we don't know. Um, no, no, nobody studied that in a way that gives a, a clear answer. It is true that I said that some people don't experience very much grief. And when I went into my big project, I thought there was something wrong with them. But now that we've finished this project studying 1300 people over four years, you know, that's one response some people have, other people have different responses, and there's no one normal response for grief. And we still do not know if it is normal and useful, or if it's just an accidental um, side effect of getting attached to people. Next up is going to be Lester, followed by J.S. Lester. Uh, years ago, I read a summary of some research, and I'd like to know if it was correct. The the idea was they had studied people who'd had brain injuries or tumors that took out the emotional center of the brain, but pretty much left everything else intact. And that these people acted normally, except they could never make a decision. And somehow the research conclusion was that every decision we make as humans is passes through an emotional filter. There's no such thing as a rational decision. Is that correct or what? So thanks for bringing that up. That gives an, I, mean, I don't know about the exact brain studies that you're talking about. Some people have talked about lack of connections to the frontal lobe doing that. Other people talking about disconnection of the amygdala kind of lesions. But the more important question you bring up is, is rationality and objectivity best? And the answer is pretty clearly no. Um, in particular, you see certain patients who cannot make a decision irrespective of what might be going on in their brain. Certain people with schizophrenia, they come to the ER and you say, we've got a hospital bed for you. And they say, well, I don't know if I should do it or not. And you spend an hour talking with them and they cannot make a decision. Some people with obsessive compulsive disorder, likewise, are just unable. And it turns out that normal people, and this is from my background as a social psychologist, normal people make decisions and then they think their decision is definitely right and you can't talk them out of it. <laughs> and this is a problem for objectivity and politics and all the rest is because most of us, once we find an answer, we grab onto it and we stick to it. And you know what? That's generally a good thing because it's necessary to make a decision and it's useful generally to stick to it unless something big happens to change your mind. Next up is JS followed by Brian. JS? Um, I wrote it in the chat room. I was wondering, could not could it be that feelings are 
uh, indicators and are to us that something is either right, maybe a disease or in our thought lines. Um, and that by, which will point us into the direction of maybe taking a look at maybe this is not serving me this way my beliefs are and I can choose differently. And that would be one question. The other question I had was about when you said that the genes want to survive, so sir, so I have cancer cells inside of me. Well, that I, I didn't make, quite hear that. that um, oh, the, the genes. Take the first one, question first. Oh, just summarize isn't the first it question. true? Bad feelings can maybe indicate erroneous lines of thinking or mm -hmm. uh, unempowering type of thoughts or beliefs. Yeah, let's just do that one. It's okay. definitely the case that emotions and our awareness of emotions, um, that's information. And the reason a lot of people think we experience, why, we're, why are we conscious of our emotions? Uh, I'll point out that emotions consist of a lot of things besides feelings. There is physiological arousal, there are facial expressions, there are um, different ways our memory works. So these are all parts of emotion. Usually when people say emotions or feelings though, they mean what you're feeling subjectively. So how come we have subjective conscious feelings? And that takes us down a rabbit hole. First, I guess we have to figure out why we have consciousness. Lord help us, uh, going to have that discussion. On the other hand, um, we humans in contrast to other organisms are able to have inner models of the world. And because we have inner models of the world, we can play out in fantasy how things might happen if we took different courses of action. And that gives us huge advantages over having to experience everything and try it out to see if it's going to work. It makes us even able to design machines and design social systems in, in a way that no other organism can. And this gives a plausible reason for why being aware of our emotions, and Freud talked about this. I mean, Freud talked about the utility of anxiety in keeping our thoughts away from lines of behavior that are just gonna get us in deep trouble. Uh, so even if he talked about how a lot of thoughts we have get pushed out of consciousness because they're gonna get us in trouble. Um, and I think he was absolutely right about that. And this comes back to this larger theme of objectivity is not necessarily what natural selection shaped and it's not necessarily good for us. And being aware of all of our inner life, I'm not sure that's so good for us either. Although not being aware of our inner life causes its own problems. Next up is going to be Brian. Brian, go ahead. Brian Nelson, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry. The, uh, so at the end of my career, I was a professor for about at the university for about 15 years. And in the last five years, the administration spent a lot of time sensitizing us to the fact that the young people, a lot of the young people, a lot of the students tend to be depressed. And the causes of that uh, were connected with uncertainty, um, as regards their futures, which obviously has been with young people for a long time. And then also uh, the social media, which has led to an increase in, in two things. Number one, information, and number two, concern about their status. Does, so do you have anything to say about the, uh, the lot of young people and depression and anxiety? Yeah, yes, I do. I mean, I hope that what I said before is the case, and it's not really as bad as the newspapers make it out, because everybody reports on what's most dramatic, and, and deans are very concerned. There's always a suicide every year in every university, and the deans try to figure out how to keep that from ever happening again, which is a good thing. But often they try to, you know, make grand generalizations about students these days, you know, and it might be that social media are causing terrible depression because we always compare ourselves to other people. And if we compare ourselves to a group of 10 or 12 or 30 people, um, we can be somebody. But if you're comparing yourself to a few billion people, um, you're not gonna be a, a hot shot. Um, and none of us are going to be very successful, especially because on Facebook, everybody puts on their best face. Uh, and so nobody really shows the troubles that they're, they're having. So I, I hope it, I hope what I said before is right, and I hope it's not getting worse, but it might be getting worse. But as for um, trying to identify students with depression and get them treatment right away, 
I would love to hear what other people say about that. I'm not sure there's time for it. I mean, certainly at Arizona State University, they're trying to do that. And, and I tried to say, wait a second, a lot of these feelings are regular old feelings uh, that people have as they're growing up and as they're trying to figure out what to do in life, and especially in times of COVID. I mean, everybody's talking about the mental health epidemic caused by COVID. Gosh, um, does this mean all kinds of people are having their brains abnormal because of COVID? Some are because of the COVID itself. But maybe we should go. I'm not sure how much more time we have, Shrikant. Um, uh, we, we, you, you have time. There's, there's no, no problem. So it's uh, completely. But there's a general point that I, I didn't make clearly enough before that I think might be good to slip in here. And that is, so why the heck in the big picture do we all have so many bad feelings that are useless? Is it mostly because our brains aren't working right or mostly because life is hard? I don't think so. I think it's, in, and my generalization, which is probably the title of my next paper, it is why most bad feel, or why bad feelings are usually normal, but useless. Why most bad feeling, or why bad feelings are usually normal, but useless. Um, and I think this changes our view of ourselves. Instead of saying, I'm a defective person, I have depression, there's something wrong with me, I need treatment. Um, I think it helps a lot to recognize that there are good reasons why low mood exists. It can be useful, but usually it is not. Why isn't it useful? First of all, the smoke detector principle. Second of all, because we live in modern environments with social media and all the rest, to say nothing of diets that cause inflammation and lack of exercise, which are big, big causes of, of depression. But then there are these regulation things, going back to what someone said before about cybernetics and all, in these systems reset themselves to increase sensitivity and going off more easily after repeated arousal. And they're even very nice, fancy complex systems models of how the perfectly normal system for an animal coming out of its hole to go hunting can lead that animal to just stick in its hole if it accidentally finds no food and nasty predators out three or four times in a row. So just an unfortunate series of experiences can shape an entirely normal system to stop exploring. And I think this is what happens with a lot of people's lives. And one wonderful way that therapy can help people is to make them realize that, no, it's not actually that bad. You better go out and test it and see if people really hate you as much as you think they do or see if the world is really that dangerous and nasty as you think it is. I mean, the world can be pretty nasty and dangerous, um, but you know, trying to be realistic about that is the essence of cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's overwhelmingly helpful for many people. Wonderful. So we'll take one last question from uh, Marisa. Uh, Marisa, go ahead. I, um, I'm really so excited uh, to, that uh, you brought that up again, because that's, you know, that's one of the biggest takeaways I, I'm getting from today's uh, chat and from watching um, several um, of your, your videos online here. The, the concept of in, like an over-medicated America almost, or like, I, I really love your, your statement. You know, you brought up this smoke detector um, theory again. Just the idea that it's not you, it's evolution. I just find that to be like a fascinating concept. And I think more people need to hear it. Um, a, a question I would have is like, why is there not more of an interweaving with like the medical sciences? Why, why is not evolutionary biology more standard? Because I feel that wouldn't it maybe make them less inclined to medicate first and ask questions later? So that brings up a whole nother thing, maybe for another conversation, another time. That's a huge topic, but you're spot on in how we, frame and the schemas we use to understand our own situations influence ourselves dramatically. And those have changed. And here's something I say sometimes to small groups, but not large groups. It sometimes seems to me that if a patient has a really strong opinion about what's causing their problem, they're usually wrong. Because the patients who came to me and said, Dr. Nessie, um, it's my marriage, you gotta help me with my marriage and I don't wanna talk about anything else. And I say, well, actually you and your grandfather and your father and your sister all have really bad depression and you've had it and you have all the symptoms of major depression. I think you should be on meds. Nope, it's my marriage, I won't consider meds, they'll just cover over the, sorry. And that person is denying the reality of a disease. 
On the other hand, someone comes to me and say, Dr. Nessie, I just want a prescription. I don't want to talk about anything. Oh, my ears go up and I think, well, wait a second, God, tell me what you don't want to talk about. Um, and inevitably, you know, they're in a terrible job being sexually abused by a boss and they can't leave the job and something bad, bad, bad is happening. And then they say, but I don't want to talk about it. I just want drugs to make me feel better. And so very often um, people's strong beliefs turn out to be defensive and, and ways of avoiding things. But I think how we think about our own problems is so important. There's a big tendency these days for people to think about things as if it's all brain diseases. Sometimes it is. And I'm so glad that we recognize that and have treatments that work for many people now. But a lot of times it isn't. And I also kept seeing people who said, you know, doctor, I've been terribly depressed for three years and I've just been waiting until someone finds a drug that works for me. Can you find another drug? And I say, you've already tried 15 drugs. Well, do you have a 16th? I'm sorry. Um, we have to talk about your life, uh, not just another drug. So this brings me to my generalization that, you know, all generalizations are false. You know, we, we really need to try to understand people one by one and that takes time and energy and who's going to pay for it much easier for a company that's trying or that's trying to provide psychiatric care to give the psychiatrist you know 30 minutes with a new patient and there's no time to do anything except make a diagnosis and write a prescription um, okay so in closing i want to ask you one question All right um it's very clear to me that you really love this field of psychiatry you have that you, you love this field of psychiatry. You're very passionate oh, yes. about it. And you're actually bringing a different epistemology to the field of saying, mm -hmm. you know, you really need to take evolutionary, you know, evolution and apply to this field. Where do you see this field? What, what would happen like in 25 years, like to, to this field? What, what, what are you hoping for? So it is very satisfying that it's growing quite rapidly in England where they have Darwin on their, you know, um, in the United States, it's been much slower um, and people are often suspicious um, because of <clears throat> wondering if evolutionary psychology is real science and, and, and such things. But science in the long run, science wins, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, we are getting a deeper understanding. And there are a lot of young people who are reading my books and other books and, and getting educated. In evolutionary medicine, I didn't mention, but half of all universities now offer courses on evolutionary medicine. I'm hoping that more of them start offering courses on evolution and mental disorders, because those young people growing up are going to take this richer um, view. And I emphasize it's not an alternative for all of these other views of mental disorders. It's more of a foundation for all of them and an integrative framework that allows us to pull them all together. And I think that by itself will prove very attractive. It won't prove immediately profitable though. Um, you're not gonna get big grants doing this or maybe I, I recently wrote an article with a South African colleague suggesting that evolution could help us find new drugs more easily. So that kind of thing, if it works, might be very helpful. But in the long run, I think that, you know, a deeper understanding will spread. Wonderful. So on that note, uh, Randy, it was a great honor and great pleasure hosting you. Thank you so much for organizing this. I really admire the way you do it and the structure that you have. And I wish you well for future ones. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Randy. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.